Hello, uh, I'm Barnaby Merrill with Raw 1251AM and I'm here with the Baroness de Souza who's yes. just given a talk to the Politics Society about a new role for the House of Lords. Uh, thanks for joining us, Baroness, for a kind of interview. Thank you. Uh, the first question I want to ask is you've talked today about kind of the role of the House of Lords, its appointed nature, ideas about whether it should be elected or not. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you was do you think that a large part of the House of Lords um, sort of uh, beneficial elements of the House of Lords come from the fact it is appointed from? <coughs> yes, I do. Um, I do think that uh, the, the appointment system actually has allowed the House of Lords to be able to recruit some of the most valuable expertise that exists out there in the world. I mean, if you um, had a, a system whereby people could um, elect themselves, who? I mean, would you, for example, have the erstwhile um, head of the judiciary apply to the House of Lords and take part in an election, you wouldn't. And yet, sort of having that sort of person on the benches in the Lords, who is absolutely so well versed in the extreme uh, nitty gritty and niceties of the law, means that he can guide the discussion. And the same is true when you're dealing with very technical subjects to do with research and medicine. If you're talking about a flu pandemic, you know, just talking about it and, and having a view is not the same as someone who really knows what they're talking about and has done all the research. And that informs, you know, the House. And I tell you something which I think is really interesting is that the House has got this amazing ability to know when someone stands up whether they know what they're talking about. And if they, you know, someone stands up, because an awful lot of people who like to stand up about everything all the time and speak at length. And the House is quite curt about that and sort of calls order, order mainly sitting and getting them to sit down. They like to hear from those people who know what they're talking about and they're very quick at discerning that. All right. Um, we took people who ask questions to stay about whether the House of Lords should be elected, for example. Um, one idea that's been brought up recently, I think, by um, the Electoral Reform Society, um, Electoral Reform Group, sorry, um, is the idea that while the House should remain appointed, it should be appointed with term limits. I think the example they gave was, for example, 15, 15 years. years. Yeah, yeah, 15 years. Yeah, and that, the, the full report's going to come out next week. Um, yes, I mean, I think that's probably a good idea. I think it needs a little bit of finessing. Uh, and obviously they're going to have to be sort of um, exceptions. But um, I, the idea that it should be a job for life, as it were, is, is, is a bit outmoded nowadays. And of course what it does give rise to is the fact that there are some people there who are well past their sell-by date, you know, um, who come in with their Zimmer frames and, you know, I mean, that is, this is not a daycare centre, it's a legislative house and I think that people should step down when they've reached a certain age. It's not necessarily the age so much, it's the degree of, of, of sort of involvement, competence. You know. um, on that note, um, would you support um, not just a term, lim a term of 15 years, but a limit, a number of terms that could be served by a uh, member of the House of Lords? So, for example, somebody could theoretically be made a peer as a relatively young person, you know, um, in their 30s or 40s. Um, if they have a large amount of expertise, is it fair to then kind of mush them out after 30 years if they still I, I, have something to offer? I, I don't, I mean, this is very, these are very detailed questions and I really don't know and I think that's going to have to be come out, you know, be ironed out in, in, in due course as to how you actually would run it. I mean, on the face of it, that seems a little bit unfair and then inevitably you'll get people who will try to be expertise and just about everything under the sun in order they can have another 15, 15 years. On the whole, though, that the people who are appointed to the House of Lords tend to be... Um, older um, and I mean I think the average age of the house is something like 70 um, there are a few younger ones but on the whole um, people are older so I mean I think that it, 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 it is fair of course it won't apply to the people who are already there which is slight a slight problem because there are many people who are there who should not be there it'll only apply you know if it's ever passed to new peerages coming. The problem about peerages is that um, we are there by virtue of a writ of summons which comes from the monarch and that is primary legislation. So in order to ask someone to leave, um, I non-voluntarily, um, is an offence. You can't do that. 
Um, and so one is relying at the moment on voluntary uh, retirement from the House, of which about 50 or 60 so far have retired. Um, and of course the attrition rate is quite high because they're very old, about sort of 25 peers die a year. But the Lib Dems certainly um, have appointed a large number of much younger peers who are likely to be there for quite a few years to come. And of course then you get an imbalance in between the parties in the House. It's, 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 these things are complicated, you know. Um, would you also, another tactical question, but you know, this is kind of an interesting thing we'd want to look at for the House of Lords. Um, the idea of the House of Lords almost as a form of jury duty for civil society. So the idea that, again, I know this requires a large amount of legislation to change the way it works, but the idea that people can sort of be summoned for a period of time um, having been recognised for outstanding sort of expertise in a certain field, who then serve in the House of Lords, perhaps only for the period of time of a specific bill or a specific issue being debated and then <clears> returning. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting idea. And I think that what it ties in with is this something I mentioned, which is that, um, OK, we've got the House of Lords and it's a house of so-called experts. Though a lot of people aren't experts, by the way, um, aren't experts. Um, if, if we were to have sort of more uh, select committees, which um, actually bring on to their, their committee people who have a real familiarity with the, the, the subject under discussion and can ask all the right questions, you know. Um, I think that, 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 that I do believe that sort of ex extending the remit of select committees is one way forward because select committees are hugely regarded and they really, I mean, they call ministers to account. Even the prime minister has to go before a select committee in the, in, in the Commons. So I think that's, that's quite a sort of... A good accountability mechanism. Uh, in a period where democracy is kind of one of the big watchwords in our sort of public discourse you know, with regards to things like the EU referendum, you know, the, the will of the people, do you feel that the House of Lords is in danger of being negatively portrayed in the media in a way that it perhaps doesn't warrant due to its unelected nature and the role it's playing in things like the EU withdrawal bill? Yes, and I expect there to be a great deal more flack in the future, particularly uh, from the very vocal Brexiteers who feel that the House of Lords as a whole, you know, is, is largely of the Remain camp and will therefore try to thwart, um, you know, any efforts to sort of leave speedily. And I think that's unfair, really, because I think that what the House of Lords um, is concerned to do is its duty, and its duty is to scrutinise legislation and to sort of make sure that the executive doesn't overstep its its powers. Um, but in, in, in relation to the question you just asked me about whether it gets an unfair press, yes, it absolutely does. Some of it is deserved, some of it is deeply unfair. And that arises, I think, out of a lack of understanding as to the role that the Lords actually plays in the legislative process. I found that in some of the broadsheet papers, um, particularly when we were dealing with, say, the child tax and work, working tax credits, that some of the broadsheets were really, really very pro the Lords and you know, said that we, we really need the Lords. We need a body like this which is able to stand up for the government when it concerns, you know, thousands of people falling into poverty. Do you think, more broadly, um, are people in the United Kingdom um, educated enough, as in, in, in a kind of institutional level, regarding um, parliamentary procedure, especially things like the House of Lords and the House of Commons? Um, the, do you feel that perhaps uh, sort of political education in this country means that people only really hear about kind of things the House of Lords does when they are big headline measures and they don't have the kind of the kind of deeper knowledge that perhaps people in other nations have of their political institutions. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And in fact, I have to say to you that when I was asked to apply uh, to be a crossbench peer, I had only the vaguest idea about what the House of Lords does. I'm amazed at how little people know about the House of Lords and its role, even those people who are constitutional historians. You know, and that's why I started off my talk talking about the House of Lords, what it does, even though this is a very sophisticated uh, public here, because so many people really don't know what it does. Um, and the wider public, they haven't a clue. I mean, as I said, they just sort of they feel it's sort of largely white old men hanging around drinking G&Ts, you know? Um, and the real hard graft work that they do in terms of hours and hours in committee going through legislation. I mean, it's not, it's not terribly newsworthy, is it? It's not very exciting. 
to report that the Lord sat for eight hours and you know covered the quarter of the bill. Um, so yeah, I think that's right, and and you know the House of Lords always been concerned to see whether it could get some kind of a better exposure and better press. And when I was Lord Speaker, I, you know, I set up several efforts to do that. And we have a sort of peers in school program, which means peers go into schools and talk to them about the role of the Lords and things like that. And final question: um, You've just touched on this at the end of your last answer. Do you think the House of Lords can do more to improve its image um, in the British public? public? Um, and improve people's awareness of what it does yes. and, its, and its role? Yes, first of all, it can, it can reduce its numbers by half. That would be a, a, big, a good move, um, because it's the public purse, after all. Um, and that would show willing uh, to, 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 to reform. But I think, too, that in the uh, Brexit negotiations that are going to come up now, um, I'm pretty convinced that the Lords will be digging its heels in a lot of the time. And I think that um, it would be very interesting uh, for people such as ourselves, politics students and constitutional people, you know, should understand what it is they're trying to do and broadcast it more. And I mean, you know, in a way, um, having the privilege of being able to talk this evening to, you, to to the students here about sort of, you know, what is actually involved in Brexit and what secondary legislation actually means is, I mean, I hope to just go on doing, go on doing that. Very nice to see you, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Just take your glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't bring makeup with us today, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm, I'm upset about that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs>